Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Quite a different topic I will bring you, being equity in healthcare. I am very honored to stand here today, putting the topic of equity on the agenda of this conference is an important signal that Wonka sends out. Under its logo, Wonka puts family doctors caring for people. And by putting the topic of equity on this, um, this year's agenda of the conference, Wonka shows that um, it is fully committed to put that sentence into action. Thank you for that. I'm standing here today on behalf of EQUIP, the European Association for Quality and Safety in Primary Care, one of Wonka's networks. And today is actually a moment of glory for, um, for EQUIP, because in the last five years, we have been working on the question how the concept of equity relates to, conce to the concepts of quality and safety in primary care. This work has resulted in a consensus um, statement which was recent, recently launched and which I'm happy to share with you in the second half of my talk. But before I come to that, I would like to start with an experiment. And I don't know if the lady from Technics can put the lights on a bit in the, in the auditorium. Um, because I would like to ask who of you have heard about EQUIP? Everyone who have heard about EQUIP stands up. Not the hand, standing up. Right. So that, that's quite a few. That's good. Okay, you can sit down again. Okay. Can I now ask everyone, all the members of EQUIP to stand up. People from EQUIP, please stand up. Yes, great people, great network. And now can I ask everyone from Vasco da Gama to stand up. Vasco da Gama, yes, over there. Young people, and now, yeah, EQUIP standing up. Keep, keep standing up, yeah. Vasco da Gama also standing up, very well. Now. Everyone older than 25, um, younger than uh, 35 standing up. 35 year olds, great. People who have been in practice less than five years, standing up please. Okay, now you watch carefully. People of Equip, observe who is standing up. These are the ones that you need to speak about Equip because you want new people in Equip, these are the ones you have to talk about. The young people, if you see older people, talk to them because they want you into Equip. Okay, you can sit down now. So I can check already one to do from my list of this talk being finding new people for Equip. Next question. And you can raise your hand. Who did not visit the Equip boot in the last few days? Who did not? Yeah, raise your hand. You did not. It's a shame on you. Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Who does not, not like Belgian chocolate or French wine? If you don't like it, put your, if you, if you still like it, put your hand up. So everyone who has not visited the Equiboot and everyone who likes chocolate or French wine go to the boot because we are having a survey over there. And if you fill in the survey, which is about equity, you can win a bottle of French wine or a box of, of uh, Belgian chocolates. And please go because I don't want to take the chocolates home. Okay. Next to do, I succeeded, being keeping you all back awake, although I was wondering, I'm quite wondering whether anyone was asleep after the former uh, presentation, <laughs> but uh, you're all awake now. I'm back uh, into the business of equity, so I can continue with my story. And my story begins with some good news, and I think we can, we can use some, some good news. And this is my good news. This is as is mentioned by Dr. 
Chawla in his keynote lecture yesterday, the health of our population has never been better before. Um, health expectancy is rising and keeps rising. And the person, the European citizen, that will become 120 years old is probably already born today. However, my good news show ends quite quickly. Because if you look um, at health expectancies in Europe, and although uh, life expectancy is relatively high in Europe if you compare it to other parts of the world, there are quite some differences between countries. Life expectancy in Europe ranges from 60, uh, 69 years in uh, Kosovo, 72 in uh, Romania, to 82 in Switzerland and Iceland. Quite a big difference. But what about differences within countries? What about differences in health expectation between population groups within countries? And for that part of my story, let me take you to Belgium. This is the city of Ghent, which is the most beautiful city in the world. This is my home. Town. This is my hometown. And on the, um, the city of Ghent, that's uh, one of the biggest cities in uh, Belgium. To put things a bit in perspective, 200,000 inhabitants. Um, city of Ghent, and then on your left hand uh, side, you see the University uh, of Ghent, and on your right hand side, the Community Health Center. Um, I'm actually also uh, chairing. And so both places are a bit like home to me. The city of Ghent is also the hometown of these uh, two great boys, Leander on the right and Andy on the left. The two boys were born um, with a few weeks uh, difference seven years ago. And they're two best friends. They met in kindergarten, they were in the same kindergarten, and then they went to the local school together, and they're now in, lo in the local uh, primary school for a couple of years. And uh, today, they're the explorers of the neighborhood in which they both live. They have very similar lives. They're a lot of time together, the two of them. Very similar lives, or not. Leander's parents, are both high educated. Dad is a GP, mom is a researcher. The family lives in their own detached house with a big vegetable garden and a dog. Andy's parents, they're struggling to get by. They were doing quite well, actually. They worked both as workers in one of the local factories, um, and things were going well, until the day mother got chronic back pain, and she had to reduce working until the point where she is now being on long-term sick leave, and the family has to survive with one wage. They're having a rough time, and they're having it very difficult to pay the medical bills at the end of the month. Two boys, seven years old. At the first sight, very similar lives but with different chances in life, already now, already, already at the age of seven. When they follow the odds, Leander can expect to become 80 years old. Andy can expect to become 74 years old. And they are, there are a lot of Andys in Europe. If you look at this graph, the blue squares in this graph, they will show you, they show you the number of children living below the poverty line in the different European countries. And again, large inter-country variances can be noted, from 3% in Denmark to over 22% of the children living in Spain in poverty. And Andy, is probably not even on this graph. Because in this type of graphs, they are using a definition of poverty which is extremely low. This kind of graphs use as, as poverty line a an, an family income which is lower than 60% of, of the median income of the country. When you compare this to, if you, if you look at Belgium, this would mean a family income which is lower 
than 15% of the net income of a family where both, both mom and dad are GPs. So that means that although these numbers are very high, if you think about it, even more children are living in, more, in very um, difficult socioeconomic situations. In 2014, Dimitri Zenol, they re reviewed the evidence on health inequalities in children. They identified 201 studies in which children's health was described according to social class. And nine of those studies were looking at differences between uh, children from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds um, and looking at their general health. And all nine of them showed that there, are, that there are significant differences in the general health of children according to the socioeconomic background of the family. 49 papers looked at developmental problems, and again, over 90% of those papers showed exactly the same thing. The lower children are on the social ladder, the higher their risk on having developmental problems. And not only poverty is directly related to uh, worse health. Simply having lower educational uh, level um, is associated with a shorter life. And this graph, graph describes you the gap in life expectancy be between the highest and the lowest educated in different European countries. This graph runs up to more than four years um, for men in the Slovak Republic. And although the differences in health expectancy are already considerable, the differences in healthy life expectancy are even bigger. And the lines in this graph show you the number of people or the number of respondents indicating their health as good or very good. The blue lines re, um, are the respondents with high incomes and the green lines are respondents with low incomes. In some European countries you can see that the differences uh, between the green and the blue lines are enormous. So people lower on the social ladder do not only live a shorter life, they live larger parts of their life in bad health. So this brings us to the question, what are the roots of these differences? How come people lower on the social ladder are losing years of life? And when I ask my students at Ghent University, I teach the medical students in, in our university, and when I ask my students this question, they're like a bit uncomfortable and they're turning around on their chairs and usually there is a brave student standing up and saying very quiet often saying this often has to do with unhealthy choices those people make let's go back to the two boys yes simon probably eats less healthy um um, Andy uh, probably eats uh, less healthy than Leander. And his mom smokes. And the family does not run in the garden after the dog on Saturday, but they watch the newest theory on television. That's true. But that's because mom is tired of worrying about how to have the, the, the ends meet at the end of the month. She fears the medical bills and she's worrying that she will not be able to, to give her children the future that she dreams for them. And because heating up a lasagna in the microwave is much easier than cooking a fresh meal when you only have a stove with one pit because you have um, reduced supply in electricity. And because mom suffers um, such a high levels of stress and never learned how to cope with that stress in a healthy way, she smokes. Yes, health behavior is an important driver of health. Um, but it's not all. An, anal an analysis of McGuinness showed that, um, or estimated the impact of health behaviors on health outcomes about 40%. 40%, that's important, that's a lot. Uh, but it's not all. 
Um, in the same analysis, McGinnis and all showed that the social determinants of health, being the circumstances in which people live and work, count for more than 40%, being for 45%, and also health care mattered, explaining 15% of um, health outcomes. Other similar analysis even speak about an impact of uh, 25 or even 43% um, of the variation in health outcomes uh, being explained by the healthcare system. Whatever exact proportion it might be, it is an important part. Um, an important part of our health outcomes are explained by the way the healthcare system is organized, and let that be a part of the problem of health inequalities, the way the healthcare system is organized. An important testimony of how it can go wrong with the organization of healthcare was given to us by Julian Hart. Not a coincidence, he was a GP. He was a GP working in a little um, mining town in Wales, of which I don't even try to pronounce the name. Um, and he was a GP with two feet on the, on the, uh, um, in the field. He witnessed the life of, my, of the miners every day. And Tudor Hart uh, published an important publication in The Lancet in 1971, in which he said that the availability of good medical and social care tends to, inversely, to vary inversely with the needs of the population served. 1971. In 2013, um, a European consortium of five universities conducted the QualiCOP study, quality, care, uh, quality, costs and equity in primary care in Europe. And we were uh, very privileged to be part of that, of that um, European study. 2017, this study showed that despite the universal and egalitarian goals of healthcare systems, access to general practitioner care in Europe is still determined by patients' socioeconomic and migration background. So going back to the analysis of McGuinness and colleagues, this means that a considerable, a considerable proportion of the health inequalities uh, between social groups can be avoided. They can be avoided if we organize healthcare differently. Those inequalities in health are therefore partially preventable, and therefore they um, are unfair and unjust, and in that case, health inequalities in health, um, inequalities in health become inequities in health. We all agree that tackling inequities in health is a very important issue, and the impact of healthcare systems is considerable. But how can a healthcare system contribute to more equity in health? And the answer is very simple. In order to contribute to health equity, a healthcare on itself should also be equitable. That's a very uh, easy answer, but it's, it's actually a very difficult um, answer because what does that mean, equitable healthcare? Does it mean we have to provide exactly the same care for all of our patients? If we do, what about monitoring blood pressure? If we need, do we need to monitor the blood pressure of, our, of all of our patients um, as frequently? But if so, what about black patients, of which we know that they have higher risks for hypertension? Doing the same thing for all patients is not equitable health care. Doing the same, uh, giving all patients the same care is actually inducing health inequalities or health inequities. In order to provide or in order to create an equitable health care system, your health or the provision of health care should be different. Um, it means doing different things for different people. 
care should vary according to the needs of the patient. And secondly, it should only vary according to the needs of the patient and not according to other characteristics of the patient, such as his age, gender, income, uh, ethnicity, language proficiency, or knowledge. An important issue in creating equitable healthcare is ensuring equal access to people, for people in equal uh, need. And access to care here is not only securing that everyone, everyone can, can access the healthcare system, but it also indicates that services they have access to uh, are the same. Um, and um, um, that the patients um, don't have to do different things in order to get access to that healthcare. Some of them having to pay more or um, having to know more, uh, having more knowledge in order to be able to access that system. So in Qualicops, we looked at access to healthcare. We asked over 58,000 European patients visiting a GP practice um, whether they postponed healthcare in the, in the last months because of financial reasons, and this is the result. In some countries, up to 30% of the patients indicated that they uh, postponed healthcare because of financial reasons. And we were talking to patients that were already in the doctor's practice. So those patients never accessing primary care were not even in our survey. But this indicates that in some countries in Europe, there might be a general problem with the accessibility of the healthcare system. However, let's take this one step further. When ana um, analyzing the answers to this question according to the income of the respondents, another picture appears. In this figure, the squares indicate postponement in low uh, income patients, uh, the circles in high income patients. And when um, the symbol highlights in red, it means the difference is significant. So this figure shows you that in some countries where there might be a general access problem, for example, Greece, um, there is no health inequity found uh, between people from different uh, income groups. In other countries, like Poland, but also like Belgium, in other countries where there is no uh, real um, access problem, generally spoken, um, inequities now clearly show. And you can see that very clearly, for example, in Belgium. And let's take Belgium and try to explain this. Indeed, access to primary health care is not a general problem in Belgium. Uh, we have a fee-for-service uh, system where patients pay about 25 euros when they go to the doctor, and they get reimbursed by, the, by their health insurance um, fund about uh, 21 euros. So the, the cost share is relatively low, and for people in low-income situations, the cost share is even lower, being one euro. And still, we see that there's a problem, and this problem is caused by the fact that in Belgium, people have to pre-finance um, the, the, the money they have to pay to the doctor. And some of our low-income patients simply do not have the 25 euros in their pocket. And they don't care whether they will be refunded the day, uh, some days after. If you don't have the money, you cannot visit your doctor. Belgian government recently changed this policy. And people with low incomes in Belgium, they can go to their GP without pre-financing the 25 euros. They only have to pay this one euro, and the rest of the money the doctor directly reserves, um, receives from the insurance fund. Okay, discussions on equity in healthcare are often reduced to the concept of access to healthcare. In 2015, Equip sent out a survey to all of its delegates, asking them about equity in the healthcare system of the country they represented. And many delegates filled in this questionnaire, and they answered us there was in their country no problem with equity in healthcare because um, they, their healthcare system uh, provided free and universal uh, care to everyone. Yes. Access to healthcare is important, but also there is more. Equitable healthcare systems do not only provide 
equal access for people in equal need, but also equal treatment and even equal outcomes um, for people in equal need. And this means that sometimes we need to put in more efforts um, to reach this goal. Recently, we undertook a, a systematic review looking at differences in patient safety in primary care and looking at inequities in patient safety in primary care. And this study showed two things. One, hardly any studies reporting on patient safety in primary care also include results regarding um, variations uh, according to the social uh, status of the patient. So there were very few studies telling us something about inequity in patient safety. But the rare studies that we found um, did point out that there are social differences, important increased risks on inappropriate diagnosis and late referral were reported for women, for black patients, and for patients with low income and uninsured patients. So there is definitely a problem also in the delivery of health care. So knowing all this, what can we do to improve equity in primary care? Instead of feeling desperate, not knowing what to do about this very complex problem uh, with a waiting room full of patients waiting for you to, uh, for, uh, to be seen by you, the delegates of Equip, they uh, decided to unite and to answer this question together. And um, it started as a discussion during um, the Paris conference in 2013. Um, These discussions turned out quite quickly into a working group on equity. Um, and many discussions and many workshops followed um, that conference in 2013. And finally, a consensus statement uh, was uh, written on, um, on equity. And here you can see our consensus uh, statement um, and the picture of everyone who was there um, to rectify it. So the document uh, summarizes in 11 statements the vision of Equip in equity, in relation to uh, equity, and in relation uh, and the relation between equity and uh, quality and safety in primary care. And this document was adopted by the Equip General Assembly in November and endorsed by the Wonka Special Interest group on equity. So what does this document actually say? First of all, Equip recognizes that equity is an essential dimension of quality um, of care, as are effectiveness, timeliness, efficiency, safety, and patient-centeredness. It is a core principle, and it should pra uh, guide practice organization and processes of care in general practice. And now I'm referring to the, to the lecture that Michael Kidd gave one of the, in, on the, uh, during the opening ceremony. Measuring what you do in practice and for which patients groups you do it gives you new insights. And in our community health center in Ghent, um, we measure or we monitor our um, flu vaccination uh, rates over the last 10 years. And previous winter, we succeeded in vaccinating 78% of our older population. And for years, this um, should have been the reason for a party on Friday evening, because yeah, we did it. However, this winter, it was different because this winter we had more information on the more information on the patient background um, in our system than the years before, and we, when we uh, analyzed our data according to the social position of the patient, this is what showed. It showed very clearly that even in a community health center where we are very um, much busy in trying to reach all of our patients, we did not succeed in uh, vaccinating the most deprived in our, in our um, group and that we created some kind of an inequity in our healthcare system or in our, in our practice. These data formed the basis of, or the basics of um, a quality improvement project in our practice that now is set up by uh, two of our students. And we hope by next winter, thanks to this quality improvement project, we will be able to have a party on Friday evening again because we reach also these patients.
working together extremely important by bringing together the expertise of health and social professions and by a better coordination of care patients will be cared for better than when you do it on your own how this is organized really depends on the context in some contexts it needs to be organized in this way whether in another context it needs to be organized completely different and again, again, I refer here to Michael Kidd's uh, examples where he showed s some examples from around the world on how people work together with different uh, disciplines to take care of people in primary care. Healthcare is largely dependent on the social determinants in which people, in the conditions in which people live and work. And EQUIP strongly recognizes the importance of community oriented primary care. Um, the strength of it lays in the fact that you start from a diagnosis of your community. You start from the needs in your community. And a second strength is that you involve the community in designing and in implementing interventions to tackle those priority health needs. Um, Community-oriented primary care is very important. Um, important. Family doctors working for more equity in primary care should be supported. Um, they should be supported because it's difficult to do this. They should be supported if they use uh, the principles of proportionate universalism. This is a very posh word nowadays, a word that is used quite a lot, this proportionate universalism. Focusing only on the most disadvantaged in our society will not reduce health inequalities or health inequities sufficiently. If you want to reduce the steepness of the social gradient in health, actions must be taken universally, but with a scale and an intensity that is proportionate to the level of disadvantage. And this is what we mean by proportionate universalism. And we need to train our GPs, and we need to train our future doctors in the idea of equity and on social determinants of health. And I'm very, very proud to be able to show you this picture. This is our last cohort, uh, last year's cohort at Ghent University. More than 400 students received their medical degree at Ghent University, and each and every one of them got information and lessons and was taught about the social determinants of health from year one in the educational program. So from year one to year six, they see me appearing and they know already at the end of their um, career, if I walk into the auditorium, they know what the lesson will be about. And I think one of our strengths is also that I work together with the people um, who are giving the clinical lessons because there I can bring in the equity principle close to um, the, the, the more clinical information they get from my colleagues. Finally, be an advocate. I have been working with Jan de Maasnir for almost 20 years. Jan was the head of our uh, department before he retired uh, this uh, last October. And I heard Jan giving a lot of speeches. And every speech in our department, he ended with the words, I feel privileged to be a GP. It is a privilege to be part of the lives of so many people. That privilege that comes with a duty, the duty to be an advocate for your patients and for the communities you work for. Let me end this talk with these two great boys again, Leander and Andy. I wish them a life where they can further celebrate their friendship. A life in which intergenerational poverty, uh, in which the cycle of intergenerational poverty and the M impact of it on health can be broken. I thank Wunka for putting equity on the agenda of this conference. And by, by doing so, contributing to the further development and improvement of equity in primary care in Europe. This makes a difference for this seven-year-old boy. Thank you. <laughs>